could follow it along with it very well. It's uh, very worshipful. Will you please take your Bibles and turn with me to Judges chapter 14. I want to look at all 20 verses here uh, this evening. Let us pray before I read the scriptures. Our great Lord and God, you have brought us back here for a second time today to continue our worship of you on this holy Sabbath day. Thank you for your spirit that works with us and strives with us and just carries us along. Father, give us a good vision for you, your son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Please use these scriptures tonight to enrich our minds and challenge us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Judges chapter 14, starting at verse 1, this is, this is titled uh, Samson's Marriage, back in chapter 13, uh, he had just been born, so we've skipped a little bit of time here between chapter 13 and chapter 14. So chapter 14, starting at verse 1, then Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Tim Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as a wife. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she looks good to me. However, his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now at that time, the Philistines were ruling over Israel. Then Samson went down to Timnah with his, mother, with his father and mother and came as far as the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came roaring towards him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. So he went down and talked to the woman, and she looked good to Samson. When he returned later to take her, he turned aside to look at the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the body of the lion. So he scraped the honey into his hands and went on, eating as he went. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they ate it. But he did not tell them he had scraped the honey out of the body of the lion. Then his father went down to the woman, and Samson made a feast there, for the young men customarily did this. When they saw him, they brought thirty companions to be with him. Then Samson said to them, Let me now propound a, uh, propound a riddle to you, if you will indeed tell it to me within the seven days of the feast, and find out, then I will give you 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. But if you are unable to tell me, then you shall give me 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, Propound your riddle, that we may hear it. So he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. But they could not tell the riddle in three days. Then it came about on the fourth day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband so that he will tell us the riddle, or we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us to impo impoverish us? Is this not so? Samson's wife wept before him and said, You only hate me, and you do not love me. You have propounded a riddle to the sons of my people and have not told it to me. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told it to my father or mother, so should I tell you? However, she wept before him seven days while their feast lasted. And on the seventh day he told her, because she pressed him so hard, she then told the riddle to the sons of her people. <coughs> so the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed thirty of them, and took their spoil and gave the changes of clothes to those who told the riddle. And his anger burned, and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companions, 
who had been his friend. <coughs> Here in the United States, we're upset with the whole COVID issue from either one perspective or another. Cost of things are rising fast. Our government is divided on many issues, and our great nation is empty store shelves. We do not see any kind of an aura of peace or tranquility in the United States. Now, if you are at all upset by uh, any of this by the times, then the riddle in our narrative is for you. During our narrative, Israel was ruled by the Philistines who worshipped false gods. The only god they didn't recognize was the god of Israel. Now we have a problem today. Most people today do not care who or what our leaders worship or do not worship. If we cared, things would be different. We often talk about people having an inner longing or emptiness that only God can fill. Let me assure you, Samson was not searching for that something that was missing from his life. He was happy and contented with himself. Samson didn't need God or anyone else, in his opinion, because he had himself. Do you know people like this? Sure you do. We know people like this, just make sure that people that know us don't see this in us, that we're happy and contented with ourselves and that we may claim to be Christians, but we take credit for things in our own life. Tonight, we're going to look at this riddle that Samson gave the Philistines so we can see what the message was for the Philistines what the message was for Israel, and what the message is for us. The first two verses starts out, and he was Samson seeing a daughter of the Philistines that he wants for a wife. It was forbidden for an Israelite to marry a non-Israelite or to marry a non-believer. Exodus chapter 34, starting at verse 14, and other places, say that if you marry outside the faith, you will be led astray. That's true then, and it's true now. His parents asked him about uh, this whole idea of marrying a pagan. They knew it was wrong, but they went along with it anyway. They just made this mere suggestion, can't you find a, a, a wife somewhere else? Israelites were to be separated from non-Israelites so that they could be a light to the nations. To be a light for Christ or for God, you must shine differently than others. If you try to become like others to attract other people or for any other reason, then you're no longer a light to the nations. You are one of them. If you try to look and act like a non-Christian to attract non-Christians to church, then you've become just like them. Samson didn't care. He didn't care about being a light to the nations. He was totally self-absorbed. We all know people that are self-absorbed. The only thing that matters to a self-absorbed person is getting what they want to get their way. One cannot be self-absorbed and be humble before God at the same time. That is just impossible. In verse 3, Samson said of this woman that she looked good to him. Hey, that was all that mattered. She looked good to him. That's all he needed uh, to know. We can please Christ or we can please ourselves. Verse 4 says that God had a hand in all of this. Nobody knew it, but God was starting to move against the Philistines. Now, just because Samson did something that God forbid and God used it to accomplish a means or a purpose does not mean that we can do as we please because God will probably use it for some good. If you'll get that out of this passage, you've misunderstood it. Samson was being absolutely disobedient to God, but God had a plan. 
and he was starting to move against the Philistines, and he was going to use Samson in a very special way. This is something that God, and he did a lot of other things in this passage that don't normally happen. This is only one of them. So we don't take this and just don't go with it too far. In verses 5 and 6, Samson's parents agree to the marriage without any problems at all. But when he went to meet his bride, guess what happened? He met a lion instead. This sounds like a nightmare for a groom or a bride that they might have the night before their wedding. They're going to go and meet their future spouse, and what happens? They meet a lion. Things don't always go uh, as, we play, as we would like to have them go. Now, it's interesting that the visit to his wife is more of a side note in this particular marriage. I mean, in this particular narrative, the marriage is not important. That doesn't mean marriage isn't important to God. But in this narrative, the marriage uh, was just a side note. Verse 8 and 9 spends more time describing the rotting carcass of a dead lion than was spent on the marriage. So the marriage isn't the issue in our narrative. It's the dead lion and the carcass and the swarm of bees and all these other things. If a biblical author, author spends more time on one thing than something else, that thing is important. The reason is more than giving the context of the riddle. A lot is said about the lion, its dead carcass, and the honey and the swarm of bees. Now, several things here seem a little odd, but they were all told for a reason. This leads to a few things that used to bother me about this passage. And I want to point out the things that used to bother me because I think the way they were resolved is important. Well, first off, I did not, I, when I first would, would read this, I couldn't see a clear biblical theological message for the, for the Philistines or for the Israelites or for us. I just couldn't see what it was. Secondly, Samson broke, it, broke his, Nazarene, his Nazarite vows. Not much is said about that in here and nothing about him breaking a vow. He broke his vow when he touched the dead body of the lion. That's probably why he wouldn't tell his parents where the honey came from, because he wasn't supposed to touch a dead body. Secondly, he wasn't allowed by his vows to eat honey from the carcass. Yet breaking his vows isn't even pointed out in here as a major issue. Also, there's no fuss made about him marrying a pagan wife. So obviously, all these things happen, but they weren't an issue within this narrative. So we don't make him an issue. But when I first studied it, I wanted to make him an issue because I said he's not supposed to be doing these things. And the author was silent on these things. Thirdly, this contradicted everything that I knew about bees and honey. I was raised with honeybees. And we hunted wild bees. We used to track bees to their home in a tree. We would cut the tree down. We would take out the honeycomb, and we would uh, uh, capture the bees, and we would take them home. Now, when we cut down the tree and split it open to where the uh, bees were, you would notice that the uh, honeycomb was firmly attached to the side of the tree, cutting it down, splitting it open, would not sever the honeycomb from the tree. So they made honey on the strongest possible foundation that they could make. That's what bees do. A rotting carcass, certainly, uh, they do not make honey and put it in a rotting ca uh, carcass uh, normally. Bees need a strong structure for the honeycomb to attach to. Plus, they always make honey where they live. It's their food in the winter or whenever it's needed. Plus, bees always live in a place with a small, narrow, strong opening so that nothing can, no predator can get their honey. A dead carcass didn't meet any of these needs of what honeybees normally do. 
And that bothered me because these were not uh, punnets. They weren't wasps. They weren't yellow jackets. Those things don't make honey. And I could not, I did not feel comfortable with a description of a dead carcass, bees, and honey. I couldn't reconcile that with breaking the Nazarite vows and all the other things that seemed wrong to me about this passage. And I went for the longest time figuring out what is the message that we're supposed to get out of this. It's easy to teach a preacher and just say what happened. That's fine. But what is the message? What are we to learn out of this? I now realize that the clues to understanding are in the riddle that was given to the Philistines. There was a very specific message for the Philistines, a different message to the Israelites and to us. It was a warning to the Philistines, and it was hope and courage, encouragement for the Israelites and for us. First, I had missed a play on words. Now, our translation is correct as far as it is concerned, but... Uh, some original words, there are no common expression in English. Let me give you an example. Our head uh, uh, translator and administrator for our seminary in Ukraine, she has two little girls, Yasser and Alona. For years, I called the little girls sweetheart. That's good. Once I asked their mother what the Ukrainian word was for sweetheart, and she says there isn't any, Sweetheart isn't translatable into Russian or Ukrainian. So I was using a word that couldn't be translated because people don't, uh, in, in Ukraine and Russia, uh, you, uh, you don't, your heart isn't, uh, 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 it's not sweet. No hearts are, are sweet. That's untranslatable. So we have a similar situation here with several words. First is the word translated as carcass in verse 8. That word that's used here for carcass in that form is only found in Proverbs and in prophecy. It refers to the fall of a nation or the wicked. So if you're talking about a nation falling or about wicked people being under the judgment of God, they would be considered a carcass. But we don't call nations carcass. So that's a correct translation. But to them, the word carcass would have said this represents God's judgment on an evil nation or on evil people. So we see carcass, they heard something totally different. In, in uh, Isaiah 17, 1, it says Dam Damascus will become a fallen ruin. The word for fallen ruin is the same word that's used for carcass in verse 8. So we wouldn't normally translate that. Damascus will become a carcass, but it will be. It'll be a fallen ruin. Secondly, the fallen nation in Ezekiel 32 is translated as a lion of a nation. The word in Ezekiel 32 is similar to the sound like the word used in verse 9 where it refers to the body of the lion. Now, some translations will call it carcass, some will call it body, but to the body of the lion. So the lion... The body represented a fallen, evil uh, city, Damascus, or a nation, or a people. Psalm 110 in verse 6, he will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men or execute the leaders over a broad country. So the dead lion and the corpse is language that would remind everyone of wicked people or an evil nation that's about to fall under the judgment of God. So the message to the Philistines was God's judgment is going to come upon you and you will become like this body of the dead lion. The message to the Israelites, they should have understood that Samson 
was without a doubt going to be delivering them from the hands of the Philistines. They were under them. They should get behind uh, Samson and rise up against the Philistines. Very easy messages for them to understand. The, you know, and this applies to us as well. We may think that we live in a totally messed up society in a world that's, you know, just falling apart. But as God was faithful in the past, so he will be faithful in the future. His judgment will fall upon the evil ones and people from amongst the good ones, his people will rise up and cause that effect to take place. Now, the Israelites, somehow they missed the message. Good message, plain old Hebrew, but they didn't get it. The Philistines didn't get it. The message was plain, the message was clear. God is going to deal with the evil rulers who have subjected his people to cruelty and slavery. This gave hope to Israel. It should give hope to us. If you're upset with things, be faithful. Help will come. Also, the word swarm of, of bees that's used in here isn't the normal word that's used for a swarm uh, of bees. It, it's translated as whenever that word is in, used in reference to the nation Israel, it's translated as assembly or congregation. So is it logical to tie the swarm of bees producing honey with the nation of Israel? Yes, it is. There's hope for the future. This was this honey, this use of honey was to remind them of God's promise in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8 where God's speaking to the Israelites. They were under the captivity of the Egyptians. God said to them, I have come to deliver you from the power of the Egyptians. We could substitute Philistines in here and bring you to a good and spacious land that flows with milk and honey. And where is that land that flows with milk and honey that God's going to bring them to? He continues on in verse 8. He says, to the place of the Canaanite the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Moses used the tribal names that occupied the land. It's easy to substitute the uh, area that they were in for any of this. This was the, uh, the, the tribes that occupied the land at that time. God's going to overthrow the people that are in control of that land and give you a land that flows with milk and honey. And so here Samson's running around with this honey that he took from this dead carcass of a lion which represented an evil nation that had been overthrown uh, by God himself. God reminded them of his special promise of a land flowing with honey. The promise was about to be fulfilled. Verse 9, it says, Samson scraped some honey into his hand. Scraped, the word for scraped means one who has rule or dominion. As in Genesis 1.26, let them rule or have dominion over the animals. You could easily translate this, well, using Mess's translation, maybe nobody else is, but it fits me. Uh, Samson subdued a lion and had dominion over the honey and the bees. The bees didn't sting him. He had domination over these bees. Now, obviously, he had torn this carcass apart so that he could get at the honey uh, and get the honeycomb out and carry that honeycomb in his land. He not only conquered the lion when he killed it, but he conquered the bees in which they allowed him to have this ac easy access to their honey. He had dominion over all of that. Now, what image should we be seeing here? As Samson killed the lion and ate the honey, God will conquer the Philistines, and Israel will eat of the, promise, of, the, of the promised honey in the promised land. 
My friends, we have been eating honey from this land that's been given to us, and it will continue. Might there be some bumps in the road if we ignore the one that has fed us the honey for so long in this nation? Yes. There are bumps in the road. Israel had a lot of them. We have the advantage of reading of all these bumps in the road that Israel went over. And every single time, eventually they turn to God and he restores them to the promised land. We have to figure out where we are in that cycle with him. The beehive and the honey should remind Israel and us of the rewards for being faithful to God even when we're living in a totally messed up society. When Samson asked the Philistines to solve the riddle, they couldn't do it. His Philistine wife couldn't answer it either. A little side note here. If he had married an Israelite, her knowing the language, she should have been able to figure it out on her own. But she couldn't, or she didn't. She was blind to the truth. It was right, laid right out for the Israelites. And we don't see any kind of positive reaction from the Israelites in this narrative. I'm just staying with this narrative for right now, okay? So we can get the full message out of this. Samson was given special strength and ability by God to kill the lion. Then he was enabled to devise a riddle to give courage to Israel to get behind him and throw off the more powerful Philistines. They may have understood the puzzle, but they didn't do anything with it. I wonder how many great messages are preached in how many churches to how many congregations are where the message just goes right by everybody. Everybody comes up to you after the sermon and say, boy, that was a good sermon I heard from you today. Are you going to change your ways? No, but it was a good sermon, right? Right? You rate them on a scale from 1 to 10 or something else. If we hit 100, uh, a 1 every week and you didn't change. I know a Baptist minister one time, he uh, 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 was preaching. Every week was on baptism. Every single week was on baptism. After a number of months, his deacons told him, you've got to preach on something besides baptism. So he said, okay. So the next week, he preached on uh, Genesis chapter 1. And when God created water, that, create, that reminded him of baptism. And off he went. All right. He didn't understand what he was doing. God caused a man to kill a lion. Bees to make unprotected honey for the benefit of the Philistines, Israel, and us. No one man normally can kill a lion himself. And honey does not normally, is not normally made in the uh, carcass of a dead animal. Those things just don't happen. God intervened here in very special ways, and things happen that don't normally happen. God can do anything he wants to at any time. So he gave Samson the ability to kill the lion. He gave the bees the desire and the ability to make honeycomb in something with no firmness to it, what's a rotting carcass of a dead lion. But he had the bees do that for a particular reason. That doesn't mean if there's an animal that's dead out in the woods, you're going to find honey in it because you're not going to. Bees don't live there. They don't, uh, uh, there's nothing to protect the honey from predators. And it won't stick to the walls of a rotting carcass. But God intervened here in many different ways and did things differently than he normally did and yet, with all of this going on, the Israelites didn't seem to listen to the message that Samson had. Verse 14 is the riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. The Philistines dominated Israel, but our faithful God was going to bring something sweet out of that evil, godless situation. Do you think he will not do this for the faithful now, even in our messed up times in our world and our society? Keep in mind that the promise 
land had flowed with milk and honey. Honey represents divine blessings to or on God's people. The spirit of God was on Samson at times. In verse 6, it says the spirit was on him. In verse 19, and in chapter 15 and verse 14. And that's good that the spirit was on him at these times. But think about Jesus. Jesus possessed the spirit without limit. If Samson did this much with just a slight intervention of the Holy Spirit, think of how much more Jesus did. We see Samson beginning to free the Israelites from the Philistines, and that's good. Jesus totally overthrew the principalities and the powers that threatens believers of all times. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 22 it says, Jesus is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. He did that for all times. Everything that can possibly rise up against him, he has taken care of. Under the sovereign rule of Jesus Christ, the church thrives in the midst of a hostile world, and we produce sweet fruit like honey. We may not know it, but every single one of us in this sanctuary tonight is eating of the honey from the promised land. God has blessed us without a doubt in more ways than we are even aware of, and he will continue to do so, even if he puts a bump in the road from time to time. We're eating that sweet honey now. For a man to kill a lion, have his rotting carcass produce honey from a swarm of bees so quickly is another absolutely amazing feat. This feat, everything in here, it seems as though it goes against how things normally work. It seems as if everyone should be able to see God at work in a powerful way. It finally registered on me that if there had been a diatribe in here uh, explaining how Samson broke his Nazarite vows, of how he married this pagan woman and did all these other things, we might miss the message for us and see it more as a history lesson about Nazarite vows and things like that. But those things are just glossed over. They're not even brought out. It's not even an issue to us. And I think this forces us to think about what is God telling us here right now? God will judge sinful nations. They'll just become a dead, rotting carcass. He will, bless, he will bless Israel, his faithful people, and we are that faithful people today. So we may be in a bad, we're not in as bad situation as the Israelites were, but we are in a messed up society. And a lot, even a lot of our churches are all messed up, let's face it. Good message for all of us. It appears that a lot of people today, just like then, don't see God working in our midst. Sometimes you have to sit down when it's quiet and think, I like to pray, but think a little bit. Are you being blessed in this messed up society? Without a doubt you are. Without a doubt this significant, God is working in your lives in significant ways. Try to recognize that and thank him for the honey that he passes out to you on a regular basis, the blessings. I'd like to end with us praying that if we feel as if we live in the midst of a rotten carcass, then we will believe that God is at work and we can continue individually and as a church to be honey to the world. Let us pray. Father in heaven, sometimes we are so stubborn. We look at scripture, we like scripture, we enjoy reading it, we absorb it, we learn certain historical facts, and then we continue on. 
But Lord, every passage of scripture has a messages for us, your people, and for others as well. Here, Samson mocked the Philistines, and they didn't even know they were being mocked. He was doing this in front of the Israelites, and they didn't understand it. Father, don't let us ever be so absorbed in our lives or having so much pity on ourselves that we can't clearly see God at work. Father, thank you for the honey that you've given us, and we pray that we will pass this honey on to other people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.